Page 10, I think that's where we left off. Last week we taught the uh, fall of Lucifer. And uh, this week we're going to answer the question, when did he fall? You know, and I mean, if you don't believe it this way, that's fine, because there's just as many who do believe the gap theory as there is that do not believe the gap theory. Then there's those who have the gap theory confused with the day-age theory. And my son and I used to go around and around about this because I believe what I'm going to teach today, and he believed that I was wrong because he thought it took in the day-age theory. And there was just no way of telling him, no, it doesn't take in the day-age theory. But anyway, we could agree to disagree. If you look here on page 10, here are two or four reasons here that, uh, that I have come under attack for teaching this because I believe in the cat theory. In fact, I don't even believe it's a theory. I believe it's, it's a fact. But like I said, those who don't agree, there, this is no reason to break fellowship over something like this. As long as everybody knows Satan did fall. <laughs> okay? That's all that's important is that they know that he did fall. When, you know, if you can agree it's before or after, whatever, but this, I, I teach what I believe, what the Lord can fix my soul with. So, uh, uh, we see the gap theory here. Number one reason why people do not believe it uh, is because they believe that actually Bible scholars in the past use this to <coughs> prove or to justify people believing in the uh, evolution. And of course, we all know I do not believe in evolution. If you look at number one, it says, I and many others who believe are accused of using the gap theory in order to compromise with science and the theory of evolution. But true science is biblical because God created all things. And true science is biblical. If it's a false science, it's not biblical. Okay? So this is absolutely not true. I do not believe in any form of evolution. I do not believe God even used evolution in any part of creation. I do know some people who are saved who believed that God used evolution in creation. And what's sad is, is that the first chapters, first 11 chapters of Genesis now are being taught in many churches and seminaries as being a myth. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of pastors and missionaries who are coming out of the seminaries now believing that the first 11 chapters of Genesis were a myth. And then they're also taught that Israel from 12 on has been replaced with the church. So we can see that we're living in the days of apostasy, the falling away from the truth. So this is not true. I don't believe in evolution in any way, shape, or form. I believe that even the laws of science disproved evolution, but they've been teaching it for so long and have it in so many books. And when they, when they were asked, why do you continue to teach it, the one evolutionist said, well, to not believe in evolution means I would have to agree that there was an intellect in the design. <laughs> and if I had to agree that it was an intelligent design, then that would make me responsible and accountable to the designer. Hmm. And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> but this is, this is their argument, okay? So then others... Uh, uh, do not believe the gap theory because they believe that it teaches the day-age theory. Now that, to me, that's total nonsense. The day-age theory teaches that each one of the seven days in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is a thousand years long. We know that cannot be true. There's no way, shape, or form. First of all, the, the word yom for day there is a 24-hour period. I mean, how simple is that? And I feel funny teaching this to you guys because you already know all this. But I, I'm going to do it for the tape for people who don't know it. Okay? So I do not believe in the day-age theory, which makes no sense whatsoever. The day-age theory teaches it took God 6,000 years to create the heavens and earth. We know that he spoke it into existence out of nothing. Out of nothing. 
So it's really foolish. And if you think of it this way, vegetation can come on the third day. Then it was the fourth day, which would be a thousand years before the sun. And so we know that this, I mean, it's really foolish. It's really foolish to even to think of that. But, you know, they argue that. So I believe God spoke the world into existence out of nothing. I believe that. Create means to create a new thing out of nothing. <laughs> out of nothing. To literally speak it into existence. And I think a lot of the problem is that people, I don't know whether they believe that the Bible was written in English and do not understand that it was written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. And so we do lose a lot of the word meaning uh, by not knowing what the words mean in Hebrew and Greek. And uh, I, I don't know any other reason why other than the fact that maybe the enemy has blinded them to the truth. Create in the Hebrew means bara, which means from the root word, ba la ba ba la whatever, <laughs> meaning absolute. It means absolute, being cre created out of nothing, just spoke into existence. And God said the evening and the morning were the first day, and that means it was the first day. So we cannot know the exact time that God created the heavens and earth. We really don't know. Because when he created the heavens and the earth, he created it in the date that was past, before man, and we couldn't start telling the time till man. Because time was created for man. It was set up for man. So there was no time in eternity past, and there'll be no time in eternity future. <coughs> time was just that 7,000 year period cut out, and this Bible records those 7,000 years. So what was before and what's after, that's God's. <laughs> that's God's. And he'll let us know when we get there. So I'm not worried about that either. So we cannot know the exact time that God created the heavens and the earth any more than we can count the stars. How many people? Year after year say, well, I've counted the stars, and now I know how many they are. And the Bible says you cannot count the stars. There's no way that you can know. Or, or the grains of sand. That'd be like trying to count the grains of sand. Okay? So then, of course, the final, the final accusation, what, what really always got to me, when they couldn't find any other reason to argue with me, they'd always say, well, she's just a woman. <laughs> You know? Yeah. <laughs> She's just a woman. I, I just want to give you the facts, and then you make the choice yourself. I remember being in a, in a church here close, and I had taught for about three years, and the, the preacher there didn't particularly agree with the gap theory and, and what I was teaching, and that was fine. We could agree to disagree. And I remember him bringing in a guy from one of the uh, colleges where he had gone to college and I remember him sitting up front and just constantly challenging me. I'm sitting in the auditorium with all the other congregation he's just constantly and he would say what do you think that means Wilma and then he'd look over to the guy and he'd say what do you think that means and then at the end of the service he had the goal to say, okay, how many of you believe Wilma, and how many of you believe the other guy? <laughs> and it was, it was quite embarrassing for the other guy, but it was embarrassing altogether to do that. You remember yeah. that? It was just really kind of embarrassing. But anyway, it's, it's not something you argue over. I believe that Satan fell in the middle of verse 1 and verse 2. I believe the, the Hebrew words prove that. I believe in Isaiah 45, 18, God says he didn't create it void and empty. He didn't create it to tohu bohu, which means void and empty and dark and covered with water. And, and Isaiah 45, 18 says he didn't create it that way. So, you know, that's kind of good enough for me. <laughs> it's just good enough for me. But there are many good scholars. And I've listed just a few of them here because people love to throw those names in there. Well, this one don't agree with that. This one don't agree with that. Well, here's a few to do. It's just like with science, with evolution. You know, you can come up with 10 <coughs> scientists for every 
one that they come up with that says, I, I believe in evolution, you come up with 10 scientists who say, I don't. And I always like to give the young people the list of the ones, these great scientists who believe that God created the heavens and the earth. But you don't get that list in school. You only get the list of the ones who believe in evolution theory. And that's, that's very sad. Look at the next page. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, like I said before, except for a few chapters in Daniel. That's why it's important if you're really serious about studying your Bible that you have a dictionary that gives you the meaning of those words. It's kind of awesome now you have it on the computer and you can just hit Strong's and it comes up, <laughs> or Unger's and it comes up. You know, of course I have all these books, but the fact is you need to know. If you're serious about Bible study, you need to know what these words mean in the Hebrew and in the Greek, okay? Genesis 1, 1 said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And of course, in the Hebrew, it would say God would be their first word. And I think I told you that last week, that it would not start within the beginning, which is, I think they call, pre uh, well, I used to know what that was, prepositional phrase. And they do not begin, the Hebrew does not begin with a prepositional phrase. And they also read from the wrong side over. <laughs> okay. So we have to realize that there is a difference in, in the way it would be printed up. So God would be the first word in the original uh, transcripts. The first word would be God, which is Elohim. And that's nothing to argue about either, but it is kind of neat to know so we can, as we go on with our study. So in the beginning, God created, and we use the word there, create. And it's only used three times in creation. In the creation story, it's used three times, and that is to create the heavens and the earth, to create animal life, and to create human. The rest of the time, a word, asher, is used, which means to uncover and to make visible. That's a big difference there, because to create means to just speak it into existence out of nothing, from God. And we know that Jesus Christ is the one who created all things. It tells us that over and over again. But let's look at our notes and let's follow them. A God, Elohim, means self-existent and is speaking of the Godhead. Elohim is always speaking of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Whenever you have I am on the end of any of these words, it means more than, not one, but more than two. That's, that's Hebrew. So, here it says, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, not the beginning of God, because God is eternal, and he has no beginning. So the word created means to speak into existence out of nothing. There are only three acts, as I said, and I've listed them here, and I've given you the scriptures. The first time create is used is chapter 1, verse 1, when he creates the heavens and the earth. And he created them perfect. Perfect. God does not create anything that's not perfect. Even Lucifer himself was perfect when God created him. Okay? What caused Lucifer to be imperfect? Sin. What caused the earth to be imperfect? Sin. But there was no man. So who could have caused this? That's, I mean, it's really just a matter of what you believe. Heavens and earth is the first uh, word used for create. Animal, we find that in Genesis 1:21, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. Right there, this proves evolution. God using the word after his kind. <laughs> okay. Right there it proves it right out. Then number three is life, the life in man. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Create, create, create. Three times, three verses does it use the word spoken into existence out of nothing. So the first verse when he says God created the heavens and the earth, he created it in the dateless past and he created it perfect. Remember when God laid the foundation of the earth, the angels sang for joy. Man was not created yet. We've got to keep that in mind. 
They were here first. The angels were here first. And as we studied Lucifer last week, we found that he was a chosen cherub angel who had a position of authority over the original creation of the earth. And when he decided he wanted to be God, he ascended. And then God cast him back down, it says, under the clouds. He ascended above the clouds and he ascended above the heavens into the third heaven. You read those verses carefully and in the Hebrew, he is cast down again back into the earth because of judgment on his rebellion. So when God created the heavens and the earth, he created them perfect. Perfect. God does not speak something into existence that is not perfect. God does everything perfect. As we said, even Lucifer. Genesis 1-2. Now the, then we have to figure out why did the earth become void and empty? Those words, tohu bohu, is only used three times in the scripture, and three times it speaks of divine judgment because of some sin. It's the only thing it's used for. Divine judgment for some sin. Keep in mind, there's no men. No man had been created. So what could be the sin that would bring the divine judgment that would cause the earth to be without form and void? Those words there are tohu bohu, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was covered with water. This is that first flood. There are two floods spoken of in the God's word, and then one fire. That makes three times the earth would be purged. Okay? And verse 2 says, And the earth was without form. And in the Hebrew, that can also say, became without form. Because the same word for was is the same word for become. Okay? And it says, without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Get this. And the Spirit of God moved. The word moved there is the word for brooded, mourning, and sadness. Why would the Holy Spirit of God be brooding in sadness and mourning and tumult if, if, he, if the Lord had created the heavens and earth that way? Why would he be brooding? Why would he be mourning? Okay? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That's verse 2. Why was the earth formless? Why was it empty? Why was it full of darkness? Why was it color covered with darkness? These are all forms of judgment from God. The waters even had to be frozen because there was no light. And it says that he looked upon the face of the waters. The Hebrew word was, was as I said, is the same word as became. So it became void and empty. Now that word in the Hebrew means this, without form, it means that judgment had happened, that it was empty, and that it was dark, and that God does not create anything empty and dark. Their judgment had to, had to happen. Judgment. It means ruin. And Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens and the earth, or the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he has established, he has established it. He created it not in vain, and that are there's your words, tohu bohu. It says he did not create it that way. Okay? He formed it to be inhabited. He said, I am the Lord, and there is none else. So look at page 12. So why was it vain and void if he did not create it that way? Something took place that brought divine judgment down upon the earth and caused this catastrophe. Something took place. Since there was no man, and we know that the angels rebelled, the judgment had to be upon who? The angels. The angels. The fall of the angels and casting them down to the earth, that caused judgment upon their habitat. They had the original position there upon the earth. They shouted for joy when God created it because of its perfection and its beauty. Okay? 
So now it says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now how long was it from the time he created it perfect and then Lucifer had dominion here upon the earth and then he was rebellious and attacked heaven how long after the judgment when it laid there covered with water in total darkness how long did it lay like that we have no idea now could some of the ages fit in there yeah they could ice age i mean any of those ages could fit in there that's why I don't argue with them. I mean, if they want to come up, they say that the earth is millions and millions and millions of years old. You know what that is? That's a guess. Yeah. I mean, it's just a guess. What have they got to, you know, look at? Like, well, yeah, look, I can count the layers on this tree. So, you know, so the earth is 30 million years old. We don't know how old it is. Why do people argue about such things? The Bible tells us not even to get into these vain arguments. Amen. You know, do not waste your time with that nonsense. I mean, there's enough here to study without wasting your time with that nonsense. We have no idea how long it laid in that condition. It could have been thousands of years. I don't know. The only time that we can count to that to with any kind of factual is to count back to Adam which was 4,000 years before Christ. And you count that through the birthdays, the ages, and so on, but you can't count before that because we don't know. We have no idea. So why argue it? I don't argue it with anybody. You know, I, I just don't. I like the chapter and verse. I like what the words mean. It all fits in place. You know, where did Lucifer fall? We know this for sure. He fell before the Garden of Eden. And the Lord spoke of him being in the Garden of Eden. Okay? So why would the Spirit be brooding upon the face of the waters? What does brood mean? You look up the word brood in the Hebrew, and it means to brood. You look up the word moved, and it means to brood. It means to mourn. It means tumult. Why would the Holy Spirit be feeling that grief? Why would the Holy Spirit be grieved? What is it that grieves the Holy Spirit? Sin. But there was no man. The only sin that was present was Lucifer's sin. The sin of the angels who rebelled against God. So now why would the Spirit be brooding if it was created this way? It's a picture of salvation. He said he... He declared the end from the beginning. It's a beautiful picture of salvation. We have the perfect creation without sin. Okay? And then we have the sin that enters the picture, the rebellion against God. And then we have the divine judgment upon sin that caused chaos and darkness. And then we have that grieves the spirit. And then what? A new beginning. When the Spirit says, let there be light, God says, let there be light, and the light comes in, and we get saved. And then we're what? A new creature. And the Bible tells us that God sent forth His Spirit and renewed the face of the earth. He renewed it. What does that mean? Renew means He renewed it. Okay? And during those seven days, Actually, six, because he also declared the end from the beginning there. There'd be 6,000 years. And people say, oh, each day is a 1,000 years? No. <laughs> it's a pattern that man would work six and rest on the seventh. The land would be worked six and rest on the seventh. The slave would have to work six and rest on the seventh. It's a pattern all the way through the Bible. And when you get to the book of Revelation, you see those patterns unfold. But you also see them unfold in the Old Testament with the feast days, the holy days, all the seven, 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 seven. God said he revealed the end from the beginning to rightly divide the word of God. And if you divide it in those sevens, whoa, it just opens up. And doesn't God want us to understand his word? Yes. Yes, he does. He wants us to understand it. So consider this. To recap here, consider, 
The words tohu bohu are only used twice in the scriptures other than this, and both denote divine judgment and chaos. Consider this, God's order is never chaos. <laughs> For he is not the author of confusion. Consider this, God is perfect and cannot produce anything imperfect. Scriptures tell us. Number four, why would the angels sing over a chaotic mess that the Holy Spirit was brooding over? Why would the Holy Spirit be brooding and be grieved and mourning? And God does not do anything in vain. This is why I believe that the fall of Lucifer came between verse 1 and verse 2. I believe that with all my heart. But if you don't, that's fine. I still love you. <laughs> <laughs> and he tells us here, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. There's a third time. And the heavens, and they had no light. And if you read that, it's because of divine judgment. And then Isaiah 24, 1, where it's used again. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down. Okay? And scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. There is divine judgment. So whenever the words tohu bohu are used, it's always divine judgment because of sin and rebellion. So in the beginning, before man was even created, there was a rebellion that caused the earth to become tohu bohu. What could that rebellion be? Now take note. <clears throat> The original earth or animal life and human life through the renewal week, he uses a different word, Asher. He only uses Bera, create, for the first creation of the heavens and the earth, and then animals, and then man. The rest of the time, he uses the word, let there. Okay, let's read it. You're in Genesis 1 3. It has, I have it in blue. Asher, the word for let there, Asher means to let, to uncover, to make appear, to diffuse. It means it's already there. I mean, it's just really simple. It's already there. To make it visible, look up the word. It's already there. In Psalms 104, verse 30, Thou sendest forth thy spirit. They are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The first day, Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light. He didn't say, and God said, create the light. He said, let there be light, and there was light. The word there for let there is the light was not created, for it was already there. It was just diffused. It was uncovered. The darkness was removed to where the light could be seen. It was already there. And then verse 4. Genesis 1-4, he said, And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. He did not create it. He let it appear, and then he divided it. This is the process of renewing the face of the earth. The light was already there. He had created it in the dateless past. Verse 5, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay? Then the second day, he doesn't use create there as well. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Please take note, the water's there. <laughs> We're talking about the atmosphere here. And he divided the waters from the above, from the waters from beneath, and he formed the firmament. All right. God made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Look at your next page. Then the third day. Again, no creation here. The same word, Asher, make it appear. It's already there. Uncover it. Okay? And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. And let the, notice it says, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. The dry land was already there. You understand? He said he had to uncover it to let it appear. It was already there. And then God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he sees. And God saw that it was 
good. So he sees the renewing, the renewing. He said, let there be light, the light comes, and then he renews. And then it's a new creation. That is a picture of salvation right there. God said, let the earth bring forth grass. And the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And then the fourth day, still, here we're four days into it. No create. The word create is not used. The fourth day, Genesis 1.14 says, And God said, Let there, Asher, the word Asher, be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And what's really interesting, if you look that up in the Hebrew, it's a light holder. It's like he took all the light and made a ball <laughs> and put it there and called it sun. Right? If the light was already there. Because he had created it from the beginning. But there had to be a sun, there had to be a moon, there had to be the stars, there had to be why? Because they are signals of the dress rehearsals that he was going to present in the rest of the book of what God was going to do in the end. Is that not awesome? Cool. Yes. Get excited, woman, because that's awesome. Yes. <laughs> that is an awesome thing. I'm very passionate about this. When God started revealing that whole picture to me, I go, oh, wow, how neat. And then to find other awesome Bible scholars who, who went like Dr. D. Hahn. He is awesome. What an awesome Bible scholar he was. And to find them and read them, oh wow, that is so, that's confirmation. And how awesome that is. The fourth day, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let there be for signs, and for seasons. And what are those words? We're studying them on Wednesday night. They're signals. They're signals of upcoming events. The seasons, listen, there were no seasons until after Noah. The earth had a greenhouse effect. It tells us in, G in Genesis that the water came up from underneath the ground and watered the vegetation. There was no rain till Noah. There were no storms. The earth was covered with a plasma. And guess what? Science agrees with that. Okay? And it was covered with plasma and made a greenhouse effect so the temperature was the same all the time. Nice. No rain, no storms. Everything was being protected. We call that paradise. Yeah. Okay? And he, he tells us that with Noah's flood, he turned the earth upside down. He moved it. And science says that it's, it's, it's crooked. <laughs> And because of that, it, it spins. And because of that, there are now seasons. And Noah, after the flood, said, God told Noah, now there will be seasons. Spring, summer, winter, and fall. There had never been seasons before. There had never been rain before. Until he turned the earth upside down. And brought what? The second flood. That's why. And then he says, don't worry about it. I'm not going to flood the earth anymore. Next time, I'm going to burn it up. <laughs> he tells us that in the book of Peter. All right? So he made, look what it says in verse 16. He made two great lights. The light holders. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. They're light holders out of something that's already present. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. See, he was, he was renewing it for occupation, for man to live on. He was renewing it. And he said, God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then the fifth day, again, look, 
The fifth day, Genesis 1.20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven, and God created. There's the word. Okay? He created. It wasn't used. The, the last four days, he created. Great whales and every living creature that moveth, with the waters uh, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth in the evening and the morning with the fifth day. So God sets the natural order of things. After his kind, after his kind, after their kind. No evolution. Genesis 1.24 said, And God said, Let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind. Over and over and over again, after their kind, dinosaur did not become a bird. Monkey did not become a man. Okay? And that professor used to sing, I once was a tadpole swimming in the sea. Now I am a monkey. No, then I was a monkey hanging in a tree. And now I am a professor with a PhD. <laughs> I love that man. I really did. I love that man. And he was a professor with a PhD and taught, had five science degrees. God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So the glory of the Lord shall endure forever. Praise the Lord. And I believe, I truly believe, that that is exactly what the scripture teaches. teaches. But like I said, I had no problem with people who don't believe that. As long as they believe that Satan fell, you know, that God created the heavens and the earth. That's good. Where he fell, you know, people don't agree with that. That's fine. I, I have no problem with that. But they, we really need to study God's word and rightly divide it. Okay, look at page 14. <clears throat> on the sixth day, and we have an order of things from here on. There is an order of creation. And if you read it straight through without realizing, wait a minute, he's adding more detail here. He's adding more detail here. In God's Word, especially in the book of Revelation, which sets it out a little more clearer since it's uh, put in, in uh, parathetical pauses. Okay? Parathetical pauses. God would give six things in a series. He would pause and give more information, and then he would give the seventh. We find it with the seals, we find it with the trumpets, we find it with the vials. I mean, we find it all the way through the scripture that he'll give a certain amount and then he'll come back. For instance, chapter 1 of Revelation gives us the end from the first chapter. And every eye shall see him coming. And then the rest of the chapters, it explains what works up to that time when he breaks through the sky. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 when every eye sees him. So this is the way God's word is laid out for us. That's called hermeneutics. It's the way God's word is laid out for us. So we have a matter of fact. There are details. The order of things is like this. He created man. He prepared the garden for him. And you know, we're constantly calling it the garden of Eden. Eden was a huge place. The garden was in Eden. Okay? Eden was a huge place. The garden was prepared inside Eden. Okay? It's just like people think of the New Jerusalem and heaven being heaven. No, it's a city in heaven. Heaven is bigger than the New Jerusalem. It's in heaven. Eat, the garden was in Eden. Okay? So he, he created man and then the garden. Then he made the covenant with who? Adam. Why? Because he hadn't created Eve yet. He created, uh, uh, he had Adam name all the animals to where Adam saw that he did not have a mate. God wanted that desire in Adam to realize that he wasn't complete. He wasn't finished until he had a mate. 
And so God had him name all the animals. God said, it's not good for man to be alone. And then he had Adam name all the animals so Adam would know it was not good for him to be alone. God wanted that in Adam's heart. And we'll look at that later. So the naming of the animals, and then he created woman. Okay? And then he ordained marriage. And it was between a man and a woman. <laughs> okay? <laughs> between one man and one woman. So let's look at the sixth day. So we just want to keep this in order. All right? The sixth day. God says matter of fact. I mean, it's, it's detail. And then he gives the, date, the details later. The matter of fact is this. The sixth day, God said, let us, Trinity, make man in our image, the Trinity, after our likeness, and let them, man and woman, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created, notice the word create. He created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. But not at the same time. As we read through that chapter, in the next chapter, we see that first he creates the man. Then he has man name all the animals. And then he creates woman. Okay, But he makes the covenant with Adam first. Why? Because Adam is the head of the race. See, man has, and I know most people don't like this, but the fact is man was to be the head of the family and the head of the home. Man was the head of the race and the one held responsible. And like it or not, God will hold men responsible for their wives. You know? So you need to be careful who you marry. <laughs> I used to tell the young people that all the time. Well, Jenny, you're the only one I have to worry about here. You know, every date is a potential mate. Make sure you date right. <laughs> because the man is responsible. He was the head. He's the head of the family. And just in the Bible teaches us in Ephesians, even in the New Testament, that the man was, uh, that Christ was the head of man, and man was the head of the woman. Okay? I do like that old movie, though, where that Greek lady says, the man is the head of the family, but I'm the neck that moves the head. I thought that was kind of funny, but it's, it's not true. That's not true. That's God. But God has an order of things. And since things started getting out of order, look what's happened to the yes. world. Look what's happened. Why? Because things are out of God's order. Yes. God has an order. And I praise him for that order. <laughs> I do. It does. And he describes this garden. Look in Genesis. Look in the box across from it there. Genesis 2 7. And the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground. By the way, man means, Adam means earth man. Earth man. He formed the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And we'll talk about this later. And man became what? A living soul. He created man, the body from the dust, and the dust it returns. The person that you are, you truly are, are being carried around in this body. Okay, that's why when the body dies, the person don't die. The person just separates from the body. And then gets a new body. You know, that's a great deal. <laughs> it is. It's a great deal. So the body from the dust, because it was earth man. He was created for the earth. Earth man. In fact, Christ is called the last man, the last Adam, the second man. And we're going to see why as we go through this. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Genesis 2.8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. I think that's so neat. In the east of Eden, he planted a garden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. I want you to notice here, and we'll get into it later on, the change in the wording. It doesn't say, and God planted a garden. It says, the Lord God. He's speaking of the Son of God. 
from, from now on, when he deals with man, it's the Son of God that deals with man, God the Son, the Lord God, okay? He is the one that created all things. If you think about it in eternity past, if you could just think about it this way, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and the choice was that Jesus would be the one who created all things, and not only would he be the one who would create all things, he would be the one who would die as Savior. He would be the one who would sit on the throne as King, and not only that, he would be the one to do all the judging. So does Jesus continue to be man, God, God, man, forever and ever? Or does he return back to the, the state that he was in as the invisible God in heaven? That's another study. Hopefully we'll get around to it. No, we won't get around to it today. But it's in your notes. If you want to read ahead, read ahead, and then we'll explain it next week. All right? The Lord God planted the garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. Take note, Eve has not been created yet. Okay. Pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Genesis 2.15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden to dress it and to keep it. What we miss here, if we don't know the meanings of this word, to keep, to dress it means to till the ground, to work it. I mean, it's a garden. It's a garden. So to dress it means that, to kind of form it, to take care of it. All right? To keep it is a totally different word. And that word in Hebrew is shamar, which means to protect it, to guard it, to protect it, to put a hedge about it, to beware. Why? Because there was evil outside of the garden. And what was the evil? It could only be Satan because Adam had not sinned. There was no sin in Adam. Can you, can you imagine the man Adam? He was created perfect. He didn't have a sin nature. He had the greatest knowledge any man has ever had. He walked in the cool of the day with the Lord. He knew the names of the stars. He knew the names of the animals. He named them. The intelligence that this man has that has been kind of worked with sin. I mean, yeah, dumbed down. Thanks, like good work. Think about that. Do, do we really stop and think about Adam, the perfect man? God created him. Perfect. He didn't create junk. He created him perfect. He had perfect knowledge. He knew that if he disobeyed God, he would have to die. He knew that. I mean, he wasn't ignorant. And he didn't willfully sin. You know, we're sinners because we sin. He wasn't a sinner. <laughs> We're born sinners. He wasn't born. He was created. <laughs> okay? We're born sinners. There's a difference, as we'll see. Lord will next week, because we, we got five minutes. Having the time goes fast. Keep it to protect it, to guard it, to protect it, to hedge about it. Look in your dictionary. What does it mean to keep it in the Hebrew? He was to guard it. He was responsible. He was accountable to guard the garden. And when his wife was created and given to him, he was responsible for her. You can't imagine the great love because it's an unconditional love. They only had each other. She was created perfect for him. You just can't imagine that kind of a love. Because what has what the world done to love? <laughs> to love. Yeah. I always tell the young people, they didn't have anybody to compare with. She was, the, she was the perfect woman for him. The only woman in the garden. <laughs> and he was the perfect man. 
And that was the first marriage and how awesome it was that God the Father walked the bride down the aisle and gave her to Adam. And the Bible says he gave her and she and he went, whoa, man. <laughs> and he named her woman because it means out of man. Because she was taken out of man. See, I don't see anything in that that belittles a woman. I say amen. Yeah. That's awesome. What do they say? Vivo la difference. God knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. It's man who's messed it up. Okay? Man. So he tells Adam to dress that garden, to keep that garden, to protect that garden. He describes the garden he planned. Look in the middle. He describes the garden he planned east of the place called Eden. Eden means pleasure and delight. Awesome. He names the four rivers that flowed through the garden. He also tells us that there was no rain. Genesis 2, 4, and 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. There were no seasons. There was no rain. It was a garden house. Can you imagine the beautiful flowers and the plants and the fruit? There was no weeds. There were no thorns, no thistles. All of that came from sin. It's all part of the curse. Yeah, I know we've been weeding gardens and stuff all, all summer long. And mowing grass and all. There wasn't any of that. It stayed the same all the time. Just beautiful. Just beautiful. And I don't want to say that I don't like the season because I'll tell you what, I do. At the end of summer, I'm ready for fall. I really am. And then come winter, come spring, I'm ready for spring. Yeah. So the change in the seasons is awesome. Nothing God does is not awesome. It's all awesome. Everything that he got, everything he does. So Adam means red earth, earth man. Adam was the first man. He was created in God's image. Take note, they were to replenish the earth. And then it tells us in Genesis 5 that when children were born to Adam, they were born what? After his image. They were born in sin. They were born after his image. So Adam was created in God's image. He was brilliant. He had great knowledge. He was the head figure. He had dominion over all things. He had great responsibility. He knew what disobeying God would bring. He was not ignorant. He understood all the Lord had taught him. In fact, the first commandment, the first law that was ever given was given to Adam. And, and it was, don't eat of that tree. Why? It, it, he could have also said, don't throw that rock in that side. <laughs> it, was, it was a test of obedience. Are you going to obey me or not? I mean, when you think of Adam, I mean, the Bible says that he's a type of Jesus Christ. It tells us that in the book of Romans. He is a figure of Christ in many, many ways. I mean, he sinned. He deliberately said, but why did he do that? He didn't do it because he wanted to be like God. I mean, all that was the temptation of Eve. And the Bible said she was deceived. He wasn't deceived. Why did he eat that fruit? Why did he put himself, why did he lower himself to become like her? I want you to think about that. That's right. Why did he lower himself to become like her? her. There is a reason for that. And we find it in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. But it's just skimmed over like it's nothing. Well, it's something to me. It's awesome. It's really an awesome study. It just really gives you the true meaning of marriage, the true meaning of love, and why Christ loved his church so much. He was willing to die. He was willing to come down to lower himself. To save what? His bride and the world in the family. I have to stop here, but let me give you a little key to this. In the Old Testament, and how many know that, that Jesus never broke a law? He kept them all. Okay? And in the Old Testament, there's a principle of the bond servant. The bond servant. It wasn't just a servant. He was a bond servant. A bond servant is one who chooses to be a servant 
and he has to be pierced to do that. Okay? So the answer to you to the question, and we're going to teach it next week. Why did G why did Adam sin? Why did Adam choose to lower himself to his wife who was fallen? His wife who was lost, his wife who he was responsible for. Okay? His wife who was deceived. He was not deceived. So if he was not deceived, does that mean he was wicked and rebellious and, and he wanted to be like God? No. There was a reason for that. The Bible says he's a type of Christ. Christ came and lowered himself to the poor fallen people and took their shame, took their curse, took their sin. There's a reason for all of that. Lord willing, I'm, I'm taking up Elle's time. Lord willing, we'll get into that next week. But it's in your notes. Study these notes. Check out these words. And then when we come back next week, you'll be ready for this study. Yes, Miss Ruthie. Um, 